All right, so let's see. Welcome, welcome everybody to the Dementia Care Collaborative's Conversations with Caregivers. Uh, this is our, our June meeting, which has somehow already arrived. Um, so I know that many of you um, have been to these before, so welcome back. And some of you, it's your first time, so welcome. I'm going to go over a little bit of um, Zoom logistics. I imagine that some of you spend a lot of your days on Zoom, and you know all about it. Uh, but some people, it might be, uh, it might be new. So everybody on is um, muted. And uh, you always have the option on the lower left-hand corner to stop your video if you need to take a bite of your dinner and you don't want everyone to see you. So you can always stop your video. Um, there's two different views. Uh, there's gallery view and there's speaker view, which is in the upper right-hand corner. So you can toggle back and forth to see the speaker front and center and her slides. Or every once in a while, you might be like, oh, who else is in here? And you might click on the gallery view. Um, so this is being recorded and it will be hosted on our website, which um, probably takes seven to 10 business days. And um, if you need to know where that recording is, you can always um, send me an email. I can put my email in the chat later so you know how to get it. So let's see. Those are the logistics for Zoom. We're gonna have um, our keynote speaker tonight, Beth Salzberg, is gonna talk for about 45 minutes, and then she's gonna do a Q&A for about 15 minutes. Um, so during the presentation, if you have some questions, you can use the chat feature, which is at the bottom of your screen to the left of the green button, it says chat. And if you have any questions, you can put them in there. And uh, Susan Rowlett will be monitoring that chat box. And when it's time for Q&A, Susan will uh, ask Beth some questions. Hopefully we can get to all of the questions, but we'll see what it's like for timing. Um, so that's kind of the, the, run of, the run of the show for tonight. Um, and then I just wanna tell you a little bit about the Caregiver Support Program. So the Caregiver Support Program of the Dementia Care Collaborative was started here at MGH um, in 2017. And we are a part of the Palliative Care and Geriatric Medicine Division. Um, as many of you know, the mission of our program is really to transform memory care. So kind of a big mission. Um, we exist at MGH to educate, to connect, and to support for patients, for caregivers, for clinicians, and really for everyone. Um, we offer care consultations to caregivers and patients in specific MGH clinics. We offer a skills course. We offer support groups and we offer health and resiliency programming, which is expanding. Um, and I don't know if you know, but the caregiver support program is entirely funded through philanthropic support. So if you are interested in learning how to support our program, please feel free to reach out to any of our team members, um, including myself. And we hope that this monthly educational series is of benefit to you. And if you know somebody who you think would be interested, please pass it on to them. We always want to, to widen the experience and have as many people benefit as possible. So I'm going to take a moment and give a shout out to all of my colleagues. I, I hope I say your titles correctly. Um, so let's see. I want to say hello. And if Susan Rowlett will leave, she's our program director. Um, to Barbara Moskowitz. She is our uh, Associate Director of the Caregiver Support Program. We have Judy Willett, who is one of our, she's our Senior Project Manager. We have Kelsey Anderson, who is a, one of our Clinical Social Workers in the Memory Care Program. And I believe we have Chris White, who's also one of our Clinical Social Workers for the Dementia Care Collaborative. And now, I wanna introduce Beth. So I got to meet Beth a few months ago at a memory cafe, um, and I'd never been to one before. And I was really struck by her, her wisdom and her compassion and her expertise. So I'm so glad she's here tonight. Um, Beth is a licensed clinical social worker and MBA, and she is the director of Alzheimer's and Related Disorders Family Support Program at the Jewish Family and Children's Services in Waltham. Service, singular. 
Um, Beth runs the Percolator Memory Cafe Network, which supports organizations throughout the state and nationally in developing and running memory cafes. She also leads the Dementia Friends Public Awareness Program for Massachusetts, and Beth works with individuals and families who are affected by dementia. And that's all about Beth, and now you get to hear her present. Um, tonight's program is called Being with Others is Good Medicine, How Virtual Memory Cafes Can Help. Thank you, Beth. Turning it over to you. Thank you, Nori, and thank you to the Dementia Care Collaborative for having me and for all of you for joining in. I, I just want to make a few comments about this moment that we're in um, as we gather together this evening. Just I'm really um, so struck by the fact that we are at a time where it's harder to be in contact with one another in the way that many of us are accustomed to. And also there are some new avenues of connection that have opened up and we'll be talking about some of those. And it's also a time of a lot of fear and a lot of mourning due to the pandemic and also the recent deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and so many others. And I would say it's also a time of hope because we're having a conversation about racial justice in our country that is long overdue. So I would just say, be here with all your feelings, whatever's going on for you, just bring them to the table. And uh, I hope that we can have a useful um, presentation and, and discussion as well. So hopefully you can see my slides there. We're going to be talking about how being with others is good medicine and particularly um, memory cafes, which are now available um, virtually. So let's dive right in. So what we're gonna cover in about 45 minutes is a little bit about the impact of isolation and loneliness and how COVID-19 has come into the mix and kind of stirred things up. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a um, grab bag of ways to stay co connected. And then I'm gonna focus in on memory cafes and talk with you about what a virtual memory cafe looks like, what happens at one, how you can find one and so forth. And then we're gonna actually have a taste of something you might do at a memory cafe. And I'm not gonna describe that now because I want that to be a surprise. So this is gonna be something fun and interactive that we'll come to toward the end. And then we will definitely make sure to have time for some questions. So um, my friends at the Dementia Care Collaborative are gonna launch a brief poll here just so we can see who is with us today. All right, here we go. Can everyone see the poll? <laughs> Not yet, maybe I have to stop. I'm gonna try stopping my slides. Okay, there we go. So hopefully you can see that. So you can choose as many options as apply to you. And this is just a way for us to all see who's in the quote unquote room with us. And of course, people can fall into more than one category. Okay, great, thank you for participating. So I'm gonna end the poll there and I'm gonna share it so that hopefully everybody can see it. Um, so the largest category is family members or friends of a person living with dementia. And then um, we've got a lot of professionals here and we have a lot of people who define themselves as caregivers. Um, so thank you for letting us know that's, that's helpful. And I'm gonna go back to my slides here. Okay, great. So I wanna to talk to you briefly about what the concept of social isolation means and compare it to loneliness because there's a lot of research out there now talking about the health effects of these things, social isolation and loneliness. And researchers need to define things in certain ways in order to measure them. And it's not always consistent. So social isolation and loneliness are not exactly the same. Social isolation is a measure of how many regular contacts with others a person has. And generally, measures of social isolation look at 
how many people are connected to a given person, how often they see them, and what is the quality of those connections. And then loneliness is something different. It's how the person feels, whether or not they're in contact with others. So for example, a care partner might be with their partner all day, every day, but they might feel lonely because the experience of being a caregiver might be isolating and maybe they don't get a chance to talk with peers about how, how they're feeling. So you see in the circles below, there's an overlap between social isolation and loneliness because they certainly are connected, but they're not the same. Now they both have risks for health. So someone who is isolated may not feel lonely. This may be somebody who's really a loner, but they may have a health event and there may be nobody around to identify it. Or maybe they are having some kind of chronic uh, symptoms that are worsening and they don't have that person in their life to notice and say, hey, you know, you should talk to your doctor. And loneliness really impacts stress and a lot of those stress hormones, which are detrimental to our health. So overall, what the research shows is loneliness and social isolation can cause us a lot of harm. And for people over 50, isolation is associated with a lot of things that are not great. High blood pressure, increased susceptibility to the flu, even to the common cold has been demonstrated in some research. Greater risk of heart disease and earlier onset of dementia. So that's very pertinent to our conversation today. So let's talk specifically about isolation and loneliness and how they interact with dementia. So there's, there's sort of a vicious cycle here because dementia can increase isolation, not just for the person with the diagnosis, but also for that care partner or care partners who are closest and most involved. Because it can be hard to get out and do the things that you used to do. And also the general public is not particularly aware of dementia and does people do not always respond in a helpful way. There can be stigma, there can be interactions that have a real chilling effect on uh, people's feeling that they can be out in the world. And of course, you know, COVID has changed the formulation completely. So, and then isolation, especially loneliness has been associated with an, an increase in the risk of developing dementia and also making the symptoms get worse faster. So it really is kind of a vicious cycle there. Just to talk briefly, the impact of COVID-19, in, in terms of research, the jury is still out because this is so new. There is research starting to appear that's attempting to measure the impact of these new kinds of imposed isolation on mental health outcomes and, and other types of outcomes. But you know, I think we're gonna learn a lot more over time. But we can say that physical distancing is really having an impact on people. Um, there's an increase in isolation for people living in residences who often are now confined to their room. That's starting to open up a little bit, but it's been a long few months and there continue to be restrictions. And in private homes as well, a lot of times a person living with dementia participated in a day program or activities at a senior center, a community center, in-person memory cafes, et cetera. Perhaps there were care providers coming in who have not been coming in. Masks hide facial expressions. So even if a person's in the same room, there's a barrier. There's a dramatic reduction in physical contact, hugging, touching, shaking hands. And on top of this, there's an increase in anxiety Healthcare workers in particular have been under stress. A lot of people are under terrible financial strain. So we have a stressed situation with less ability to soothe each other through proximity and contact. And the reason that I put this picture there of handprints, now that's, that's a cave painting, that's a very old painting. And to me, it symbolizes that human beings have always needed each other. It has been a matter of survival to band together with others, and we have very deep-seated responses to isolation. So this is 
COVID is, is a big thing and uh, it is certainly affecting us. Now that said, um, I always want to mention that one size does not fit all. And I've heard some very interesting things as I've reached out by telephone to the participants in my memory cafe. Um, for example, I've talked to people who say, you know, we were already isolated. We were already accustomed to being at home. And now everybody's kind of in the same boat. So actually we feel less alone in a funny way. Um, I've also heard people say, you know, we don't mind being home. We, we're at a point in our lives where we've developed our own resources and we don't need to be out and about so much. So I've heard a lot of resilience in that way. And the other thing I've heard is people saying, you know, we're having Zoom meetings with family members from across the country who we haven't talked to in a really long time. So there are ways that the gaps are actually closing right now. So all of this is true at once. I also want to mention, because I went over some scary um, statistics and ideas about the impact of social isolation, um, statistics are not destiny. Um, so you can find studies that say, um, you know, often it's cited that about 25% of adults 65 and 65 and older could be considered socially, socially isolated. And, um, and that, that has very detrimental health effects. A lot of people have heard about, you know, it's worse than smoking a pack a day of cigarettes. Um, there's a study from, from Rush in Chicago that um, social loneliness in particular doubles the risk of developing dementia. So these are scary kinds of numbers, but an individual's risk is not about their category. It's not about their population group. It's about their individual life circumstances. So whenever I give talks on dementia, I always say, if you're worried about your own cognition or that of someone else, talk to your health, health provider and begin to look at what your personal situation is. And most importantly, we can do something about isolation and loneliness. So that's what I'm gonna spend the rest of my time here on, is really talking about what we can do. Small changes, large changes, what are resources out there? And I wanna say that both care partners need ways to connect with others. So if there's a, a situation where um, there's a person living with dementia and somebody who's close to them, they both need connections. It's not just the person with dementia. The poll or earlier indicated we do have a lot of care providers, both professional care providers and, and family and friends with us today. And so I always want to emphasize you matter too. Now, a lot of times when we think about getting out and connecting with others, we think about, well, what would be something fun? And something fun, you know, metaphorically, it could be like, um, you know, eating a Snickers bar. Well, I love Snickers bars and they're great for that first bite, but it doesn't last very long. You know, your blood sugar kind of goes up and down and that's it. So I think it's also good to look at some of, some uh, deeper um, inquiries that maybe are gonna have a little bit more, uh, have a little more fiber and protein to them as it were, and have a deeper, more lasting impact. So what does the person value? And that could be associated with a profession that they've had. It could be associated with perhaps their role in the family or among their friends. What is meaningful for that person? And is there a way to find connections that, that dovetail or tap into those values and senses of meaning? And then, so those are kind of big, deep questions, but on the flip side, is it possible to just try something? Because you never know. And so is there a way to connect with others that's relatively easy to just try? Let's just go for a half hour on Zoom. Let's just call in to this program. Let's just try it. Low cost, let's see what happens. So as I'd mentioned, I wanted to give you a bit of a grab bag of resources, just so you know what's out there. And then we're gonna focus in on memory cafes. And there are handouts that 
um, Nori and her team can share, which have actually the links to these programs. So if you want those, um, they can provide them. So there are many, or not many, but there are a good handful of programs that are available by telephone on a scheduled basis, because certainly not everybody is comfortable on a computer or has Wi-Fi or has the hardware. So DeRoad is a program based in New York, but it's available to people anywhere. Um, Covia Family Elder Care Mather Telephone Topics, they all do kind of um, adult education, sometimes more support group-ish, sometimes more learning and information, but these are programs you call into. And then online, there are quite a number of things, some of which are designed for people living with dementia specifically. I'm going to talk more about dementia mentors a bit later in the presentation, but both Dementia Mentors and Dementia Alliance International are forming on an ongoing basis, they're forming cohorts of people living with dementia who gather on Zoom. And then for everybody, virtual memory cafes, the Alzheimer's Association offers something called Alls Meetups, which are geared toward people with early stage dementia specifically, um, but they're social and arts-based. There are, there's a program called Arts and Minds, which does interactive museum tours. Silver Kite does intergenerational art programs. There's also a lot of recorded materials that you can use at any time. And uh, I won't go through this list in detail, but a um, lot of websites. And I guess what one interesting angle with these is that oftentimes family members or friends um, are not sure how to interact with the person living with dementia and they kind of fade away. And so what you might do is reach out to someone who could become part of that circle again, but equip them with something they can do together. So uh, for example, Time Slips, it has a um, web page called their Creativity Center where they have these beautiful questions which are just wonderful evocative questions that people can use to launch into a conversation. They don't require any recall of information. They're all about imagination. So you might um, you know, ask a cousin, can you call mom maybe once a week and you can do one of these beautiful questions with her. And that way the cousin feels like they have something that they can do. So again, these, are available on a handout with actually the websites and I encourage you to take a look because there's a lot of really great resources there. So let's focus in on memory cafes. A um, few points about them. They're free of charge. There's over 120 in Massachusetts now in four languages. The majority of them are English only. There's several that are bilingual, um, Spanish, English, there are Spanish-only memory cafes, Portuguese, and Chinese mem memory cafes, and many are available now virtually. These are group programs, so I recognize they're not for everyone because some folks just, you know, are not group people, and that's part of why I wanted to give you that previous grab bag of other resources. That said, you never know till you try. I've been running my memory cafe since 2014. And I can't tell you how many times one of the guests has said to me, I would never do this <laughs> while beaming, smiling. You know, we'll be um, dancing or doing improv, doing improv games. And this person, you know, maybe it's somebody who in their earlier days, um, you know, worked as an accountant, just a very buttoned button down person and they'll say to me, I would never do something like this, but they're doing it and they're loving it. So you never know till you try what somebody may like. The nice thing about virtual cafes, they're real easy to try out. You don't have to leave home. You just, you know, tune in and you can stay as long as you like. So what I want to do now is walk you through the key ingredients that make a memory cafe a memory cafe. So um, they are welcoming in their atmosphere. They're really informal. The focus is giving people that welcome that they may not feel out in the world because of the lack of understanding 
about dementia in the general public. So memory cafes are really designed to be very warm places where people come with their symptoms and symptoms happen at memory cafes and that's fine. It's not a problem. Everyone understands and it's, it's a, an open door. So welcoming is number one. The focus is on social connection. Long before COVID, memory cafes were focused on reducing the social isolation that often comes with dementia. So that is their goal. It's not, the goal is not to be an educational program. It's not to teach people a new dance that they can then perform on stage. It's really about bringing people together and reducing that sense of loneliness. They're designed for care partners and for people living with dementia. So all the activities, everything about it is designed to be interesting and engaging for people with a very wide range of cognitive needs. And they are absolutely for the care partner as well. Sometimes people have called me and asked, you know, can I drop someone off who has dementia? And most cafes are, are open to that if the person living with dementia is able to enjoy and manage the program on their own. Um, some cafes do require having someone with the person with dementia. I don't. I certainly have had people living with dementia attend on their own um, as long as they're able to do everything they need to, to enjoy socializing, to you know, get their own food, use the restroom, manage their own transportation. They can come on their own. But I always say when I get that question, you know, the cafe is for you too. And what I have found is that care partners often don't even realize how good it feels to do something fun together. And it's also a kind of respite for them because it's a chance to connect with other people who are in a similar situation a daughter, a spouse, um, a friend. We have lots of pairs of friends who have come to our cafe. So it is really designed for both. And then um, memory cafes in Massachusetts serve people at any stage of disease progression. So I had mentioned the ALS meetups, which are an Alzheimer's Association program. Those are specifically geared for people with early stage dementia. Memory cafes are not. There are some in other parts of the country that focus on people with early stage dementia, but here in Massachusetts, all the cafes are for anyone who can enjoy them. And we certainly have people attending whose symptoms are very mild and really wouldn't be noticed in a social situation. We have people attending who haven't been diagnosed, and we have people attending who have advanced dementia. And we have people who have any number of underlying conditions. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, vascular dementia, frontotemporal degeneration, traumatic brain injury, a combination of the above, um, progression of Down syndrome into Alzheimer's. It's extremely eclectic. And so one hallmark of memory cafes is we don't ask people if they have a diagnosis or what it is. So they're not being asked to put themselves into the box of care partner versus person with a disease. And that's especially important because we want that door to be open to people who haven't been diagnosed or people who really reject that diagnosis or aren't aware of it due to the disease progression. We don't want them to have to kind of pass through that threshold in order to have this opportunity for social connection. So they are not gonna be asked their diagnosis. And then finally, cafes are tailored to local interests, languages, and needs. So every memory cafe should look different. Uh, when they are held in person, they're located in all kinds of places. They're located in community centers, libraries, senior centers, restaurants, um, faith community congregations. There's one in a bowling alley in Boston. There's one in an outdoor garden in Topsfield. So they're really meant to um, take shape according to the local community and what people are interested in and what they need. So all memory cafes should strive to be inclusive. I, I work with um, cafe coordinators all over the country and I always say, ask yourself the Mr. Rogers question. Who are the people in my neighborhood? 
And am I serving them? And if not, how can I? So um, that's something we talk about in the CAFE network all the time. And in addition to all CAFEs being inclusive, CAFEs are needed in multiple languages and all communities. And it's really um, unfortunate that COVID has sort of temporarily made it harder, essentially more expensive to run a cafe because there's been this need to transition to virtual programming. A lot of cafes are run by organizations that are also supporting basic needs for their participants. And a lot of cafes have had to go onto the back burner. And I would say that for communities of color, which have been hardest hit by COVID-19 and often already dealing with fewer resources, it's been that much harder to sustain cafes and to start new ones. Um, you see a little box on the right, which is from our um, Massachusetts Memory Cafe directory, where you see the um, cafes in different languages. But it's, it's hard right now for those cafes to operate. And I'm going to give you the link to that directory page a little bit later. Now, on the plus side, virtual cafes can be attended from anywhere. So just a couple of examples. San Antonio, Texas has been running a bilingual Spanish-English cafe. And I know people around here have been going to that. And also, there's a fairly new cafe in Brazil. And um, I know Portuguese speakers, Brazilian immigrants in our area who've been attending that one. So that's the plus side is that distances and transportation needs have sort of evaporated. So these are just a few pictures from memory cafes around Massachusetts, just so you can sort of see the smiling faces. Um, you see there are people of various ages. A lot of cafes have volunteers. Um, who may include young people, uh, people from various parts of their community. You may also notice there's a lot of creative arts going on. And creative arts are often a part of memory cafes. They are particularly suited to memory cafes because when you're joining together around a creative activity, there are no right or wrong answers. It's really not about knowledge, it's about um, spirit and emotion. And so it's a kind of a level playing field, no matter what the cognitive needs are of the people who attend. In fact, I've noticed something interesting over the years, which is sometimes care partners have a little bit of trouble getting into a creative activity if it's unfamiliar to them. It's usually a care partner who will be saying to me, I can't draw a straight line or, you know, I can't sing. Um, whereas a person living with dementia whose inhibitions might have decreased a little bit is more able to just jump in and enjoy themselves. And I love that. I think it's kind of a, a really nice leveling that happens. So I did a poll recently of our Massachusetts cafes and what I found is about a third of them are meeting virtually right now and another 10% are in that transition period. So um, there are a good number of cafes that you can attend virtually if you want to give that a try. And just to give you a specific idea of what a person does at a virtual cafe, I thought I would show you what we did at my cafe, the JFNCS Memory Cafe, in April, May, and June. And obviously every cafe is different, but um, this will just give you a flavor. So, in, um, in April, we had a sing-along. We called it Songs of Spirit and Resilience. My wonderful colleague Margie Sokol led that with her guitar, and we used Zoom to show the lyrics. And we had participants who only use a telephone, and I had mailed the lyrics out to them in advance, and that worked out well. And then in May, we had an art educator, Jane Blair, who has a company called Art Matters, and she led a program about Marc Chagall. And similarly, I mailed the slides out to, a printout of the slides out to our participants who only use telephone. And then most recently, we took a sentimental journey with singer Doug Schmoltz, and he played guitar and had slides, and, and we sang and listened. And you can find the two sing-alongs on the JFNCS web page if you go to jfcsboston.org 
right there on that front page and scroll down, there's a, a box that shows virtual recorded programs available for you to view. And at the bottom, it says Memory Cafe. If you click on that, you go to our YouTube page and you can find these recordings as well as a tango lesson that we did in March. Um, so you can feel free to check those out and get an idea of what a virtual cafe is like without even having to go to one. And plus, they're just fun to watch and sing along with. Oh, actually, so this is what it looks like when you go to jfcsboston.org. There's the box that says virtual programs and memory cafe is right at the bottom. So I, I want to um, kind of anticipate a question that often comes up, which is, yeah, is it possible to really feel a sense of social connection through Zoom mm, or some other online platform or telephone. And, you know, I've been asking myself this and observing what happens at my memory cafe and talking with cafe people around the world about what's going on over the last few months. And I really feel the answer is yes. Um, and as an example of that, I want to um, go back to Dementia Mentors, which I had mentioned earlier. They've actually been running virtual memory cafes on Zoom for six years. And care partners do not participate in their virtual memory cafes. These are run by and for people living with dementia. Not only that, they are international. So I had the privilege of sitting in on one some time ago, and I was quite impressed to see the palpable sense of connection among people who are in different parts of the world, different time zones, accents. Um, they were all speaking English, but people definitely had different accents and it was over Zoom. So I really do believe that um, while we love to be together physically, this is a very real and meaningful way for people to connect. And you can go to DementiaMentors.org and to their Memory Cafe tab, and they have a 12-minute, um, what they call a tour of a virtual memory cafe. So again, you can check that out and see what you think. And if a person in your life who is living with dementia is interested, there's a process where they can join a virtual memory cafe. So I promised I was going to tell you where to find cafes, and I shall do that. So there is a national directory here that added a special section for listing virtual memory cafes. So the website is memorycafedirectory.com and then you click on Cafe Connect and it will show you a calendar with virtual cafes being held all over the place that anyone is welcome to participate in. In addition, my organization, JF and CS, maintains a, a directory of Massachusetts memory cafes. And this is our webpage, jfcsboston.org forward slash memory cafe directory. Now I'm in the process of updating that directory right now to show whether a given cafe is running virtually and any new information about RSVPing. So I hope those updates will be done in two weeks. If you go to the directory right now, you're just gonna see the information about the physical locations of those cafes. Um, but again, um, about a third, and we're climbing up toward 40%, are running virtually. So certainly if you see one in your town or nearby, you can contact them and find out their status. One other resource that's on the Massachusetts Memory Cafe directory page that I want to alert you to is that we have a one minute video in English and in Spanish, which show you what a cafe looks like in action. And we recorded this because we know that these are unfamiliar to a lot of people and that it could be daunting to try this kind of program that you don't know about. So you can watch that. And in fact, um, I'm gonna show you the video in a minute so you can see it. This is what the National Cafe Connect directory looks like on just a, a given week. So you can see there's quite a number of programs available to attend that are located in many, many different places. And you're also 
cordially invited to the JF and CS Memory Cafe. Our next meeting is Friday, July 10th. We are gonna have fun expert, Linda Joyce Glazer, who does sort of an eclectic range of singing and other activities. And if you're interested, please just send me an email and then I will follow up with you with all the information. So now I'm gonna just take a moment and play you this one minute video, which shows the JF and CS Memory Cafe the Aroma de Café in uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts, and also the um, Grove Hall Memory Café in Dorchester. So it's one minute. Let's hope that I can make it play here. It can be lonely living with Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia. But you are not alone. Memory Cafés across Massachusetts are bringing people affected by dementia together at welcoming social events. It's fun. I am so thankful to have a place where my mom and I can go and laugh and just enjoy the experience. I've made new friends. They understand what I'm going through because they are living it through. Memory cafes encourage me to try different activities, which is really refreshing. You'll find guest artists, musicians, and dancers, educational programs, or simply a place to relax and chat with others. These free gatherings are offered weekly or monthly, and you can go to as many as you would like. Visit jfcsboston.org slash memory cafe directory to learn more and find a memory cafe near you. So hopefully you could see that, whoops. No, <laughs> there, don't wanna start that. Sorry about that. Okay, there we go. That's the problem with showing a video is then it just goes on to the next thing. But I do have a TED talk about memory cafes. So if you're interested, feel free to look that up and watch it. Um, but what I wanted to do now with the next few minutes before we open it up for discussion is just give you kind of an experience of what might happen at a memory cafe. I had mentioned time slips which is a really wonderful organization based out of Milwaukee, started by Ann Basting, who is a professor of, of um, theater and English at University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And the whole idea is that rather than uh, creating a sense of pressure for people to reminisce and remember, we can create together, and that that way we can be connected no matter what a person's cognitive needs are. So if you go to timeslips.org and click on resources, you can get to the Creativity Center, which has those beautiful questions I mentioned. It also has a mini project option, and it also has a storytelling option. It's free, but you're gonna need to create an account, a, a login ID for yourself, if you wanna use the database of, of storytelling. So, there are lots and lots of wonderful photos, and the idea is that you use them to create a story. And so I'm gonna just show you what this is like. So I picked out a photo here, and I'm gonna ask a few questions, and I would love to hear what your responses are. So maybe we can unmute people. Can we do that? Um, so I'm gonna see if I can unmute everybody. Oh, actually, you have to unmute yourselves. That's yeah. Right. <laughs> so I think <laughs> Zoom, had, Zoom changed this. So, so I'm going to ask a few questions, and anyone who has a response, please just go ahead and unmute yourself and jump right in. So what I'm going to say to you to, to kick this off is that this is a photo, and we are going to invent a story together of what's happening. So tell me, what do you see here? Anybody? A son dancing with his mother. A son dancing with his mother. That's great. And what do you think you would hear in this photo? What kind of sounds are happening here? A band. Mm -hmm. What kind of music? Latin music. Latin music. Is it a live band? Yes. Yeah. What kind of instruments do you think? Trumpets. Trumpets. That's Guitars. Great. Guitar, did I hear? 
Yes. Guitar. What kind of scents do you think there might be in the air? What could you smell if you were there? Food. Food, mm. yeah. <laughs> I didn't quite hear that one. Food. <laughs> Food, yeah, sounds good. That makes me hungry, it's dinner. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and who do you think these people are? So a son and a mother. Let's give them a name. What, what shall we call the mother? Juanita. Juanita, I love Juanita. it. Do you want to tell me anything about Juanita? It's her birthday. Oh, her birthday. How old do you think she is? About 85. 85? That's great. And does she like birthdays? Yes. yes. Yeah, excellent. She's a party girl, huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's Thank great. You. And so who is it dancing with Juanita? Her son. Yes. Her son. And what is his name? What shall we call him? Manuel. Yes. Manuel. That's great. And again, we're just making this up. There's no wrong answer. You can say anything that comes to mind. So Manuel and Juanita are dancing. And where are they, do you suppose? Where shall we say they are? In the town square. Town square. And what's going on in the town square? There's something special happening. A festival. There's a festival. Her birthday. Her birthday. Festival for her birthday. Mm -hmm. I love that. So the whole town has turned out to wish Juanita a happy 85th birthday. What a what a great occasion. And um, what do you think is going to happen next after this photo? What's going to be the next thing that happens? Bringing out the cake. Bringing out the cake. And food. Mm -hmm. Cake and yeah. food. That's great. And so let's give this, let's, so I'm going to just recap our story here, what we've got so far. So we have Manuel with his mother Juanita, and today is a very special day because it's her 85th birthday. And it's so special that there's a festival in honor of her birthday in the town square. And there's the sound of live music, it's Latin music, we hear trumpets and guitar. And in a moment, the cake is gonna come out along with food, and that's going to be delicious. Okay. So shall we give this story a title? Yes. Birthday Any in the Square. Birthday in the Square, that's great. <laughs> So thank you. So that gives you a, a short sample of what can happen in time slip storytelling. And I did the same picture with my memory cafe a year ago. And just to give you a sense of how different the stories can come out. So that title was Together Again. And it was Cinco de Mayo in San Antonio, Texas, 95 degrees and humid, but they didn't mind. And it was Herbie and Grammy a grandson and a grandmother, and they love to dance so much that they ducked under the police line back here in order to dance. And by doing that, they won a dance contact, contest, and they're about to be given the trophy, and they're also about to be told that they can't do that because it's illegal. <laughs> and Grammy says, I do it again in a minute. <laughs> so, um, and then a reporter interviewed them and the story was, there is joy in Texas, winning couple incarcerated. That was what we, that was what we came up with a year ago at the JF and CS Memory Cafe. So just to give you an idea, every time you tell one of these stories, it's gonna be different. And sometimes reminisces, reminiscences do arise, um, but they're not forced. And so it's a way to be together without any of that pressure that sometimes comes up when a family member quite naturally says, you know, who's, who's this in that photo? You remember this and kind of really is trying to pull a reminiscence out. So thank you for trying that with me. And what I'm going to do now is just um, put up my contact information awesome. for a moment. 
Again, if you're interested in coming to the JFNC's yeah. Memory Cafe, drop me an email. Well, I'm on the middle of a Zoom call though. And um, you see the cafe directory website and also the percolator memory cafe network. So if any of you here are interested in knowing more about how you start a memory cafe, we have tons of resources. And I know that um, Nori is happy to share these slides, so I don't want you to feel like you have to jot everything down. Beth, you're on mute. Oh, Beth, you got muted. I'm sorry. That's okay. No problem. No problem. Um, if you didn't hear it, I'm happy to share these slides. They can be sent out to you. So if you don't have time to write everything down, don't worry. And um, can we go ahead and move to questions and comments? Sure, definitely. Yeah. So please, if you guys have thoughts or questions, please put them in the chat box. Um, a couple of things you may have already answered, but just to reinforce a couple of things that came up. Um, what's generally the platform for memory cafes? Is it Zoom? Is it something else? And can people participate by telephone mm -hmm. if they don't have a computer? That's a great question. The majority of cafes that are meeting virtually are using Zoom. Um, Zoom is very common, but it's not universal. There are also cafes that use um, Google Hangouts. There are also cafes that are streaming on Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. um, so there are different ways they're doing it. There are cafes that are telephone only. Um, so I had mentioned a bilingual cafe in um, San Antonio, and they're doing it by conference call. So they have a Loteria, which is a Spanish bingo um, board that they email out to everybody in advance and then people call in and they do it on the phone. I know a poet in New York who's doing poetry parties um, for a lot of cafes and other programs and they're by, by telephone and he makes them sound like an old fashioned radio call, uh, radio show and they're interactive. There are a lot of cafes like mine where people can either participate by connecting with Zoom or by telephone. So there's the option because we have participants who don't use computers. There's a great, great question in the chat box, but I wanted to just ask before we get to that. Um, I love that you say, and I love that you stress so much, just try, just give it a try. And I think that might be easy for those of us who tuned in for this call, right? But, but for those folks who experience dementia, sometimes the first response is no. Yeah. So I wondered if you had any advice about that, about how to help people give it a try. Yeah, I have a few thoughts. In fact, I'm gonna just jot a couple things down. Um, I, um, so one thing I want to say is that, um, for people who have advanced dementia, a teleconference sometimes can be confusing and it's hard to know until you try it. Um, my memory cafe is, has been attended for the last three months where we've been meeting virtually by several people who have advanced dementia who have been really enjoying it. So it's not one size fits all. Um, I do have a couple of guests who have always been regulars at our cafe who have opted out because the teleconference format has been a little confusing. So it isn't necessarily about whether the person has advanced dementia or not. It's very individual. There's one gentleman who attends our virtual cafe who finds it hilarious. I mean, he, he thinks it's so funny to see all these videos on the screen, but he's happy. So the fact that it's confusing doesn't matter because it's a happy flavor of confusing. But if it is distressing, then it wouldn't be a good thing. And I, I really have to say, you almost have to try it to see. Um, you don't have to stay on the whole time. You could try it for 10 minutes, 15 minutes and see how it goes. You could watch one of the recordings and see how that goes over. And if that goes over well, then you might say, okay, the flavor of this program seems like a good fit. We'll try a live one and see how it goes. Um, I think 
The other piece of it is the technology, which is a real challenge for all of us in these times, myself included. I mean, I really um, have found it challenging to get up to speed on um, Zoom and other teleconferencing technologies. And I'll tell you honestly, if I didn't have to do it, I wouldn't have. <laughs> but what I have found, like anything, the more you do it, the easier it gets. Um, at the JFNCS Memory Cafe, uh, we have a partnership with Brandeis University. There's a student group there that um, has volunteered with our cafe since 2014. And just recently, four of the students have trained to be tech volunteers. So they are available to make a telephone call to one of our cafe guests or FaceTime with them at a separate time and help them learn how to use Zoom or another platform that they're trying to use. So I think steps like this are really important because we're all struggling to get across this digital divide. And right now it is a really important way to access a lot of resources. So I hope that answered the question. But definitely you can feel free to drop in to a program and not stay the whole time if it's not working out well. Yep. And would you say it's okay for caregivers to participate you know, they're the person, they may try with the person uh, that's living with the disease and they may wander off and may not be interested, but it's okay. It's it for, is. it's for the both people. Yes. It's for the family, everyone. I'm so glad you mentioned that, Susan. It is fine. And, and care partners are welcome on their own as well. And um, I've had care partners who want to check it out first on their own before they include the person living with dementia, you're absolutely welcome to do that. I have care partners who come on their own regularly and it gives them ideas of things that they can do at home or virtually with the person in their life who lives with dementia. Um, there are also care partners who had attended with their loved one who passed away and they continue to attend because they've become part of our cafe family and that doesn't change. So any and all combinations are welcome. Um, dogs, cats, babies, grandchildren, we've had them all at the cafe. And in fact, it's really fun. That's a fun aspect of this virtual world is that we get a little window into each other's homes. Um, so it's a very informal environment where people are just welcome to come as they are. Yes, which is wonderful. There's so many elements of that that you mentioned. I love the idea of, I just love getting ideas from it to use at other times during the week when the memory cafe is not going on. It's such a, it's, it's a wonderful in so many ways. I think that one of the questions um, here is that uh, how to get in touch for phone call-ins. And I think that information is on the slide. So that's to email you or to inquire um, on the calendar to see directions to all the different groups and how to connect with them, either by phone or virtually, correct? Exactly. So for example, that calendar that I showed you in purple, the national directory, if you clicked on one of those programs in the calendar, you would then get all the information about how to RSVP, how, you know, how the program is run and so forth. And our Massachusetts directory will be updated with that in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a slow process, unfortunately, because it's just a time of so much change. So it's just taken us a while to receive those updates. And now we're in the process of getting ready to put them all on the website. Great, great. And so uh, someone mentioned that, this, that the day programs, as we know, or most of them are not, or all of them are suspended for the moment, for the time being due to the virus. Um, and so is there a way to introduce this to families who have been attending um, a day program? And the question goes on to say, it, will it be more challenging to maybe start a new memory cafe without having one in person? So maybe you can talk a little bit about if there's interest in starting a new cafe as well. Yeah, so those are both great questions. The big difference between a cafe and a day program is a day program is many hours and often people will attend several days a week. So there's a kind of continuity there and there's also a bigger block of time um, in the day that's, that's, um, that is utilized in a day program. So it's really tough for people whose day programs are not meeting. Um, I think that's 
that's been a very hard aspect of the pandemic. And so I would never say that a memory cafe would take the place of that because it's a much shorter program. They usually meet um, once or twice a month. Some of them meet weekly, but you know, it's, it's a shorter, um, more limited time period. But it certainly offers some of the same benefits for that shorter period of time in that it's social connection, it's interaction, it's engaging. It's something where the care partner doesn't have to be the entertainment. They can, in fact, enjoy it as well. And it's very important with folks being home and often isolated to find ways to be engaged during the day, to be active. A lot of the programs have physical activity as part of it, dancing or yoga, and that's all really important. Those kinds of things during the day promote a better night's sleep which is really important for everybody. So absolutely, um, those who are missing their day program could um, take a look at memory cafes and give them a try. And with so many of them available at different times, you know, you could attend one every day, you could attend two every day. That might be overwhelming, but <laughs> just to give you an idea, there's no limit to the number you can attend. For those interested in starting a memory cafe, um, there are a lot of resources on the Percolator webpage. In fact, we just had a big two-hour meeting about how to make the transition to a virtual cafe. And I've talked to a lot of people who had been planning to start a memory cafe, and they've been trying to figure out whether to start it now or whether to wait until we get through the pandemic and start it as an in-person program. But there are definitely people who are launching their cafe on a virtual basis. And I'd be happy to talk to you offline. Um, I have resources I can give you and, and some guidance I can provide. And I think the jury is kind of out. You know, we don't really know what that looks like so far, but um, absolutely, I am a believer that meaningful connection happens over the phone and online. So there's no real reason that it couldn't, the cafe couldn't start that way. Yeah, and I love the idea that this raises is that for folks who've been attending a day program, who are participating in this program, or who are running a day program and you're trying to figure out how to reach back out to the families you would be serving, is to let everyone know. It's such a, you know, let every, all the families who were using day programs, let to spread the word that there are these options for people to tune into. Uh, I think we've, we've been fortunate to get this wonderful resource from you tonight, Beth. So that's spread the word far and wide for everyone. You know, Susan, one last, one last thought there that your comment made me think of is if there are people that you're connected with at a day program, meet up at a virtual cafe. And that's something that I, I've seen happen many times at my in-person cafe. There were people who joined together. You know, word of mouth is is often how people find their way to a memory cafe. And it's been wonderful over the years, not only to see new friendships start, but to also see friends who already know each other meeting up there. And you can absolutely do that on an online cafe. You can, you can say, let's join, you know, let's all go to the JFNCS Memory Cafe on July 10th together, and we'll see each other there. So feel free to do that. The nice thing is we have plenty of room, <laughs> you know, I. I, um, I always bought a lot of food for my memory cafe and worried, well, I have enough food. And I don't have to worry about that now. You bring your own food. So um, there's no capacity issue. So please feel free to join us. That's great. Um, I just wanted to ask you, because I know you know, uh, this is outside of the memory cafes. Can you talk a little bit about the Alzheimer's Association activities? Do you know what they're offering virtually these days? I can, I can um, at least give a bit of a response to that. They offer so many programs that I'm sure I won't be able to mention everything, but um, in response to the pandemic, they have um, been doing a lot of new programming and also making a lot of their regular programming available virtually. So the ALLS meetups are programs that um, are similar in nature to memory cafes, except they're specifically for people with early stage dementia, with mild symptoms and their care partners. 
um, and those are now virtual. Um, they offer lots and lots of support groups, both for people living with dementia and for um, care partners. And so those are available virtually now as well. I also run a support group for adult children of a parent or parents living with dementia, which we do on Zoom now. Um, the Alzheimer's Association also provides just lots of wonderful education programs, both community education and education for people living with dementia. So I've been diagnosed, what do I do now? And also for family caregivers. So um, I would definitely recommend that you call their helpline, which is the gateway to all of their programs. And I can tell you that number, it's 1-800-272-3900. I'll type it in. <laughs> um, maybe somebody can put that in the chat. Yeah, I'll do it real quick. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so it's always a good idea to call them and just talk to them about what's going on and, and see what they have to offer. There you go. Um, great. Wonderful. I was really curious about the ALS meetups. I can never remember that name. So that's what I was interested in because I know they do some museum mm -hmm. visits when they're meeting in person. So I'm happy to hear that those have moved to a virtual format as yeah. well. That's fantastic. Um, I'm just wondering if anybody else has any questions for Beth while we have her here. I could talk to you all day, Beth. I, can I <laughs> ask one more question? And I think it has to do with that, uh, that connectivity um, virtually. Mm -hmm. So do you find that people are interacting with each other and, and able to meet each other or make connections with each other while the, the program is going on? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I think during the program, people are able to experience connection. And so my memory cafe is probably pretty typical in that part of it has a facilitated something. And I described what those were um, earlier in the program, you know, singing together, etc. And then part of the time is just talking. And one thing we've started doing at our cafe, which I'm really enjoying, is the last half hour, we have the Brandeis students choose one of those beautiful questions and we have a discussion. So I can see people's faces. I can, you know, hear what they're saying. There's a palpable sense of connection. And that includes for people who really have trouble using language, but they're engaged, they're looking, they are responding. Um, so I feel that people feel less lonely during the cafe and that probably stays with them for some time. I am not sure whether people are getting the same opportunity to meet people who they will then see outside of the cafe right. when they meet virtually. And my guess would be less so because it's just different. You know, when you're in a physical space together, you're sitting at a table together, it's more intimate, smaller group. It's more natural to say, you know, where do you live? Oh, what other things do you do? Maybe we should meet sometime. Um, and we, we've, thought about trying breakout rooms to put people in smaller Zoom groups, and we haven't done it yet. And I'm worried that it will kind of put people over the edge in terms yeah, of the complexity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But we do miss that smaller opportunity. So, and that's know, not to, I was just curious, and that's not to negate at all the, the engagement that you're experiencing. Um, I think yeah, that, no, absolutely. But I think it's an important question. I, I think no doubt we all look forward to a day where we can be together in a room again. However, I think when that day comes, I'm going to want to find a way to continue offering a virtual option, right. whether that's a particular meeting at a different time of month or a camera going during that same program. I'm not sure yet. But it, the virtual option has made these programs accessible to people who just can't get out of the house Absolutely. or live farther away. So it actually has become, it has increased access for some people and we don't want to lose that. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've experienced the same thing at the Dementia Care Collaborative that 
we've been so pleasantly surprised that we've been able to reach more people and that it had, we've benefited from it. And um, I know it's good for us to get to see everybody each month. So I'm just gonna turn to my colleagues before we wrap up, we just have a few minutes and I'm not getting any questions in the chat, but just uh, Nori, Barbara, Moskowitz is there. I, I'm sure Judy Willett is still there. Doesn't, do any of you have questions or comments? Uh, I was just gonna say that um, it really is possible to have these connections um, virtually. I think we've seen it at our other conversations with caregivers. We've seen it on our Thursday programs. Um, I've been pleasantly shocked that we've been able to build a virtual community of movers through Ageless Grace. Like people know each other now. They come on in the morning and say hello to each other. So I think real connection is possible. So I think that's really been a, a delight to discover. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. So thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you all today in our virtual community. Thank you. Beth. Thank you.